Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce the chair of our next session. This is the, the land session. <clears throat> That's why we call it TLS down at COLA. It's the Allen COLA. Paul Dermar can explain to you what it really stands for. But uh, anyway, our, our uh, chair for this session is Pierce Sellers from NASA, so I'll turn it over to Pierce. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I won't uh, spend much time doing biographies. Uh, everybody who's talking this afternoon is a rock star, and uh, so I'm going to get maximum time. Carlos Snobbery, take it away. Thanks a lot, Piers. Good afternoon to all. Uh, I, I'm interested, since I was a teenager, I've been very interested, fascinated, in fact, by the Amazon. So I went to work in the Amazon after finishing engineering, degree in Brazil, and then I came to MIT start, to start PhD from the Amazon. So uh, it was natural that after I went back to Brazil, I got involved very much into Amazonian studies. And then I was very glad to receive Shukla's invitation early 1988 to come to Kola and start uh, deforestation study, the climate impacts of deforestation. Then I met Pierce. So it was a very good combination, uh, let's say a, a dynamicist, fluid dynamicist with somebody with deep knowledge on biology who had already developed SIP, the simple biosphere model. So, you know, uh, Linda was talking about multidisciplinarity versus interdisciplinarity. I like interdisciplinarity because I learned so much from Pierce. I had zero biology. And I hope Pierce had learned a little bit from me as well. So anyway, uh, and also thanks to Shukla, who is always very uh, visionary, because 1997, 98, there was really before the real Earth Summit in 1992, before IPCC, before Agenda 21. So. I think we did some of the precursory studies. Of course, the Amazon has grandeur, it's a, it's a beautiful natural system, and uh, captured the attention and the fancy of many people in the world, many people in South America. So we decided to look at that, but of course, the main reason, the main reason of the urgency is the rapid rates of destruction of the forest, which were very high in the 80s, 90s, uh, and only declined in the last few years. I will come back to that. So basically, uh, we're very bold, Pierce, Shukla, and myself, in 19, 1990, 1991, we posed this so-called Amazon civilization hypothesis. And that hypothesis gained a lot of attention. There are hundreds of papers discussing from modeling, from theoretical, from observational point of view. During the LBA experiment, that hypothesis was tested extensively and continues to be tested. So I think it was interesting for us to be the, the pioneers in, in a sense of putting forth this hypothesis, which in 1998 to 1988 uh, 91 was a simple model in which total radical deforestation of the Amazon and then a post deforest climate would be drier in this southern portion and would entail a savanna, no longer a forest. That was a very simple biogeography model and uh, that really was the, the, the roots of the, the, this hypothesis. Savanna ecologists, they hated the name, savanization because they thought we were putting, devaluing the, the ecological value of savannas. Of course, that was not our idea. It's just to say the new post-deforestation climate, the climate envelope will no longer sustain a forest, but just a savanna. And then further on, I got very interested in looking at this savanna uh, forest boundaries, uh, looking at this as a complex system. Uh, it's not driven by total rainfall. The, the, the figure is total rainfall, which is 
plenty in the Amazon, but this boundary is zero order. Uh, its explanation is driven by the duration of the dry season, long dry seasons, savanna and short dry season, there is a transition here. Four months dry season is probably the threshold. So uh, in a subsequent study with a former PhD student of mine, we look at whether, looking from a complex system point of view, whether this system has only one stable equilibrium or more than one. And then we found, in fact, uh, numerically, we found there are two equilibrium is the current forest, green here, and the second stable equilibrium, which is savanna covering mostly the eastern, southern portions of the Amazon. Numerically, this is robust, statistically significant. And perhaps after LBA, we have a good idea that meteorologically, an understanding land surface boundary layer atmosphere interactions and the rainfall systems, perhaps one can even think why this area would be more susceptible, susceptible to become a savanna. You see, this uh, rainfall is controlled by large scale process, so the South Atlantic Convergence Zone, it's mostly uh, wet season. This is sea breeze control, and this midst here is there are instability gravity lines moving from the coast, but it's mostly controlled by land surface process. 50% of the wet days have little rainfall before five millimeters. So there's a good place for land surface to play a role. And that's actually what the models are, are predicting. That area without forest, rainfall diminishes substantially and it becomes a savanna. So in, in a simple diagram, basically we, we could see uh, as, a, as, a, as a framing for research the two stable states, one covered with forest, the other one forest savanna, and the stability of this is tremendously enhanced by fire and by increased droughts. If you have increased droughts, then you make this second stable state much more robust, much more stable. So we look at uh, these drivers. Many people did, I'm not talking about only my own research with my students, but uh, reviewing a lot of studies. Basically, the main drivers are deforestation. This is, was the original driver, the reason for the study, original study. But of course, uh, global warming is an important one. Increased fire frequency, fire frequency today, due to human intervention, is about 10 times more frequent than lightning caused uh, fires, natural fires, and of course there is elevated CO2 and the possibility of CO2 fertilization effects. So very briefly, I will just review very quickly uh, some of the results of this analysis. Uh, deforestation, we've found that there is a call, I, I, I call tipping point, but you know, just paying attention, this is always steady state cal calculations, they are, do not, it's not abrupt, it's just saying, uh, if you go past a certain point, the new climate vegetation equilibrium will be irreversible. So you don't go back to the original state. I'm not saying this transition will be abrupt. Uh, so basically, a study looking at several patterns of deforestation, you see here, forest, pasture, savanna, and basically when you reach 40% of deforestation, it does not change anymore. So 40% is our first tipping point. If you go more than 40%, then the, 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 the vegetation, the climate equilibrium is the same. Um, also looking, many people did those studies. This is one example. Uh, looking at, uh, if you get IPCC, this is old study, IPCC AR4, uh, scenarios, many, many models, and you project that onto the uh, biogeography model, with seed vegetation types. So basically, the conclusion was you get a large portion of eastern Amazon uh, uh, turning into savanna. The new, the, the new climate would be a savanna-like climate. Uh, then one has to look, of course, at the 
the positive, supposedly positive effect of CO2 fertilization, uh, many modern uh, observational studies supported by modeling studies today would indicate the Amazon to be a sink, carbon sink, due to mostly due to elevated CO2, perhaps some climate effects, but it's mostly elevated CO2. So if you look at several, only climate, several climate uh, model simulations here, and uh, this is not much forest, but when you have CO2 at a maximum assimilation rates, if you put 100% effect of CO2 fertilization, then you have quite a different figure, uh, uh, picture. So you have to look at all those things. And uh, then uh, we did this looking all, all the synergistic effects uh, of global warming, deforestation, fires, and elevated CO2. I will just summarize some of those results here. Uh, deforestation at several levels of deforestation, climate change, we look at several scenarios, RPC R5, but for this figure I'm picking the, the worst case scenario, 8.5 in 2050, and you see this is control, and you see of course the forest, the trend is moving near the Andes, because the Andes provide a moisture mechanism, a uh, rainfall mechanism, which is semi-permanent. Even under s different conditions, uh, the, the Andes keep uh, moisture and rainfall high, perhaps sustaining uh, a biome like a forest. So if you look at many of these, these calculations, this is percent of uh, forest area. Uh, this in particular is for three IPCC scenarios and 20% uh, deforestation and fire. The fire effect has been also uh, parameterized for these calculations. And then you get something like between uh, 40 and 50% forest remaining. So that, that's pretty much what we can say today. There is a serious risk of all these combined synergistic uh, drivers not only global warming, not only deforestation, but the combination of all those drivers. And including this calculation uses a forest uh, CO2 fertilization effect at 25% assimilation rates, pretty much like mid-latitude forests. This is a major uncertainty how forests, tropical forests respond to elevated CO2. Apparently they are sink. So we are planning a, a major international program. LBA like to study a phase type experiment in the Amazon in the coming years. So making a summary uh, of all this, not only of the studies I reviewed, but many, many others, uh, we can say, qualitatively speaking, the stress shows, which is reversibility. Again, I'm not talking about time scales here. I'm talking about moving to a state which will be irreversible on a long uh, long range. So thresholds would be something like 3.5 and 4, deforestation more uh, larger than 40% of the area. So all what observations show? Observations show uh, so far global warming is about in the Amazon a bit more than 0.8 close to 1 degree. What's the limit of temperature changes related to deforestation. About 1, 1.5, that's what LBA has shown. So uh, let's say deforestation in itself will change the climate, uh, but not increase temperature uh, to very high values. So uh, temperature increases have to come by via global warming. Deforestation is about 20%. I will talk a little bit more about that. What about fire? What about then lengthening of the dry season? When we pose that uh, salinization hypothesis, the main thing we highlighted was pay attention to the length of the dry season. So this is the controlling factor. If the dry season be becomes lengthier, then you should expect the forest to, to succeed into a savanna or impoverished savanna. So, uh, first two 
deforestation limits. This is a deforestation annual deforestation map. Brazil is doing great, I'm sorry, make, no, I'm not making propaganda for my country, but this is true. I mean, this is deforestation rates were very high, 27,000 square kilometers one year. Now they are down to less than 5,000, and Brazil policy call for uh, less than that. Uh, this is very successful deforestation control policies in Brazil. And I ha I'm happy to say that th these policies were very well informed by science. Oh. So, the, uh, global warming, I mean, this is very uh, high scenarios, all are in, in excess of four degrees, so global warming is a very important one. Fire. Uh, fire is increasing the Amazon, as I said, and there are uh, some fire control fire experiments in southern Amazon, so we have some feeling how fire will do to savannization, and uh, this is plots with fire mortality is much higher. So fire, as expected, is uh, a driver that can accelerate deforest uh, savannization, like you know this this picture will show you. Is the dry season length becoming longer? Okay, this is the main diagnostics. I will move very quickly. My time is running up. So basically, this study for one area with severe deforestation, if you look at uh, September, uh, October, November, all set of the rainy season, apparently there is a downward trend. So this is evidence number one for one area in southern Amazon. Another study of diagrams, months, and rainfall from 1950s to 2010. Again, indication, this is 100 millimeter a month, def defining rainy season, indication of longer dry seasons. And the third study, uh, thanks to Rong Fu, who is here, uh, and has studied this uh, in, in detail, also, uh, they found the dry season to become longer and lengthier, uh, and the length is increasing. Is this natural variability? Is this something related to global warming? Is this related to the driver, local driver of deforestation? We don't know, but s somewhat, s somewhat uh, we have to be careful about and look carefully. Another thing which is intriguing is in the last 10 years, we have had five record-breaking extremes Droughts 2005, 2010, floods 2009, 12, and 14. Probably two of these out of these three uh, years uh, are related to are related to excess rainfall as well. Not only floods, but excess rainfall. So uh, I, I'm just. Uh, this is a summary of what I've said. We have to pay attention to as a diagnostics, the length of the dry season in Southern Amazon. Uh, let me, oh, okay. This is all steady state, steady state calculations, but we have to be even more concerned because uh, this is from IPCC summary. In fact, I mean, trees can only move to adapt to a new climate at a very slow speed, a few kilometers per decade, and uh, let's say, uh, so speed of climate, the climate velocity here is much higher, except for RCP 2.6. So all the others, I think the Amazon trees would be outraced. Finally, uh, I've been involved in, in policy in the last four years, so I learned the difficulties of implementing, of bridging the gap between science and policy. So I've been thinking a lot for many years about sustainability policies for the Amazon, try to implement a few, and I came up with uh, that we need a new paradigm for the tropical forests of the planet, not only the Amazon. We have to add value to, to the heart of the forest, and we need really a new innovative science and technology has to offer solutions for the emergence of a, a local bio-industry. We have to completely ignore the current models of tropical def deforestation, beef production, soy, uh, palm oil. We have to come up with the values of uh, 
the biodiversity, and uh, along with empowerment <laughs> and mass education of the people. And that's really, the, he's a real astronaut, isn't he? <laughs> and that was my last comment. Thank you. Do we have time for one question? Um, I, I think this is uh, very important, these changes in the long trend in the, in the drought. And uh, are you sure that this is related to the large scale circulation changes, or do you have some indication that it might be due to local effects, or has there been any attempt to separate it? There has been many attempts to separate. I will give you the short, short answer, perhaps over coffee break I can give you the long answer. There are many possibilities. Uh, certainly, large-scale uh, driving is there. However, in, the, in LBA, a lot of studies have looked at, for instance, the effect of aerosol, biomass aerosols, in uh, uh, delaying the onset of the rainy season, excessive uh, particles, aerosol particles. This is one. The other one is land surface coupling, boundary layer coupling during the dry season over pastures also. Uh, diminishing rainfall. So there are many possibilities. It's probably a combination. However, rainfall in many parts of South America, they have the PDO cycle. So we have to be very sure uh, whether we are not going through some natural variability. Oh, since you're running, yeah. uh, just a silly information. Brazil, the time series you showed about the rate of deforestation. Can you just tell us about the whole Amazon, what's happening? Not just the Brazil. Uh, not as pronounced as Brazil, yes. but declining, deforestation is declining. Good news, perhaps the few good news we have had in years. Deforestation is declining all over the Amazon, more in Brazil. Deforestation is declining in Southeast Asia and also Equatorial Africa. Excellent. Thanks, Carlos.